Almost half of the work we do at Bill Bird Shoes is a third degree deformity. Now in the spectrum of first degree, second degree, and third degree deformity, what is a third degree? Well, the first degree, you recall, is where the client, say their foot is collapsing, it's, it's flat or something, uh, and you ask them to raise their inner border, and they can do it. But they just, once they've forgotten about it, their foot will go back. So that's the first degree is self-correcting. Second degree is where the foot isn't strong enough to be corrected by the client, but we can push back on it by raising up the border, inner border, say, with a, a arch support or a metatarsal pad, or that it, so the foot can be passively corrected. With a third degree uh, deformity, and remember there's, this is a spectrum, so there's fuzzy, fuzzy areas in the middle, um, the third degree has to be left in the shape that it is. The foot has become fixed in that shape for whatever reason, and any attempt to change that shape will be painful. Sometimes you can have somewhere where you can correct the foot a little, but you'll never get it back to the way it should be, and that's still a third degree deformity. So where does a third degree deformity come from? Well, there are four general areas that we've identified as the uh, source of a third degree deformity. The first is a congenital deformity. So it's be something like this foot, which is a talipes. Uh, the foot was bent in, out of shape in the mother's womb, and when the child was born, this was the shape that, it, that the foot came out in. Nowadays, we can correct a lot of that with splinting and things. A hundred years ago, club foot was the main thing that orthopedic shoemakers did. Now we hardly ever see it. Here's another example of a congenital deformity, where somebody is actually born with this huge elephantine leg, which is uh, uh, absolutely massive. And, and actually so massive it doesn't function. So literally we're just holding the whole leg together with this boot. Again, a, con con uh, a congenital or from birth deformity. So you're beginning to get the huge variety of shapes we're seeing here. Another uh, source of third degree deformities are road traffic injuries and industrial in injuries such as this shoe, which looks relatively normal, but actually you can see the massive uh, shape in here where the foot has been uh, crushed and injured. And so what we have to do with this shoe is uh, hold the foot in the shoe in the shape it is, and then get the shoe to rock rather than bend, because any movement of the foot is painful. So that's a road traffic injury direct to the foot or we can have an industrial or road traffic or other injury to the leg above the foot, uh, which leads to a leg length discrepancy or difference. And that is something that we do a lot of. In this shoot, for instance, you can see we have a cork inside that's hiding about 15 millimeters of difference. And if in that was in a shoe, you wouldn't see it at all. And then you'll see that the heel itself is again another 15 or uh, 20 millimeters higher. And you can see the leg length difference by the top of the last here and the top of the last there. It's about 25 millimeters altogether. And so that's another, uh, all those injuries uh, that happen uh, is another source of third degree deformity. And then there's a whole set of deformities that are acquired over time. Call them wear and tear deformities, if you like, where you get bunions developing or swollen joints. You get toes that are retracting and hammering, or the foot becomes flat, or you get a tailor's bunion on the outside. Again, a huge variety of shapes can arise, and they need to be accommodated. And if you look at this shoe, Underneath is a soft kid. The bunion will protrude out, and we simply deal with it by covering it with a nice little tie applique that attracts the eye to the applique so that that's what you see. You don't see what's going on underneath. 
One of the biggest sources of third degree deformity is systemic disease, such as polio. It's very rare now, but many of the people who are now in their 60s and 70s contacted polio uh, in the 1950s epidemic when they were two or three years old. And that can leave huge permanent deformities. Rheumatoid arthritis can show up any time after the age of 15 to 20 uh, and can stay with a, with a person, keep as a live disease for decades. And you can see this lady, a young mother of two, and you can see how this, from the inside, the shape of her foot, not so apparent from the outside. But this shoe, and this is about the third or fourth pair she's ordered, has just transformed her life. She can have something that, given the shape of her foot, is actually looks reasonably normal. And when people glance at her foot, they just see a strap court shoe. They don't actually see the huge bumps and distortions that are going on there. Diabetes is becoming increasingly common, particularly type 2. In fact, we're even seeing type 2 diabetes in teenagers these days, whereas it used to be called late on onset and didn't show up till people were in their 40s. And diabetes has huge consequences on the foot. It can cause fragile skin, which we've seen elsewhere. It can cause anesthesia, which we've talked about elsewhere. In other words, an anesthetic foot. It can cause circulation problems. And it can also cause what's called a Charcot foot, where the foot entirely collapses. Now, the reason, say, for instance, 60% of people with a size 6 foot can walk into a shop and buy a size 6 shoe and it will fit them is that that 60% of people with a size 6 foot who can just wear a size 6 shoe are more or less healthy. A healthy foot is very similar to another healthy foot of the same size and that's why we can make one shoe to fit a huge number of people. As soon as these uh, D distortions start to show up, particularly third-degree deformities. The variety of shapes goes from one foot being relatively similar to another to one foot being hugely different to another. And the uniqueness and variety of shapes is such that someone with a third-degree deformity will find it almost impossible to go out and buy a shoe off the shelf. And even if they can get a shoe, they can get their foot in it. They won't be able to walk in it with any degree of comfort. To give you an example of just how varied uh, the third degree deformities are, I want to show you three examples of a Charcot foot. So a Charcot foot is where diabetes has weakened the bone structure so much that the foot literally breaks in the middle. So the back part of the foot is still relatively strong. The front of the foot still works more or less, but the middle of the foot is totally collapsed. So if you look at this foot, it's totally collapsed inward. This is representative of a diabetic foot with a Charcot deformity. It's totally collapsed inwards. Now you look at it this foot, it's the other side, this is a right and this is a left. But if you look at this foot, it's also a diabetic foot. It's also a Charcot foot. But look, instead of collapsing inward, it's collapsed outwards. And so you've got this curved shape um, from the, uh, the toes right out and then back in. Whereas this one, from the toes, it goes in and then out. I'm going to show you a third foot. This is a cast of a foot. The brown is where we added a bit to create a bit of extra space for cushioning. But this is also a Charcot foot. It's a diabetic foot that's collapsed in the middle, but it hasn't gone to the inside. It hasn't gone to the outside. It's gone straight down. Okay, so what you see there is the deformity, the Charcot deformity, is the lowest part of the foot. Whereas it's in the middle of the arch, it should be the highest part of the foot. So you see one goes to the outside, one goes to the inside, and this has gone straight down. So 
same condition, same disease, huge variety of shapes as a result. Now I want to talk about just one condition because if everyone is totally unique, then every solution is going to be totally unique. And uh, each solution isn't just the shape of the last, you know, which is totally unique for that individual. It's also the, sh the prescription that goes into the footwear in order for that person to not just fit into the shoe, but to be able to walk with comfort. There's two things. To get your foot into the shoe is one thing. To be able to walk in comfort is another thing. So there's those two distinct things we have to uh, look after. The last will get your foot into the shoe, but it's the prescription that will get you walking again. So if we look at this individual, this is his sandals. He's worn them. They've come back for uh, repair twice now. Uh, he lives in these in the summer. Here's the cast of his foot. Underneath this joint, it's very, very soft and you know, kind and really, really deeply embedded in. Back here, it's almost like a platform that his heel can stand on. So when he puts his foot on all the way, 80% of the weight bearing is through the heel. You can see that. 80% of the weight bearing is through here. Maybe 18% of the weight bearing is in front of the distortion on here. And of course, when at heel lift, it all comes on and the foot rolls off and he takes a step. Maybe about 2% of the weight bearing is through, through this uh, distorted bone. And the reason we want 2% there is we don't want to break the foot completely by supporting it there and supporting it there and letting it drop down here. Okay, so we've got to give some support there. And so we've got to find a balance between enough support to stop his foot uh, dropping down and breaking further and it being painful and actually causing an ulcer. Of course, because having diabetes, fragile skin, so not only have we got really distorted bones projecting out, but the skin is so fragile that one wrong move and you've created an ulcer and have the potential for amputation. Okay, so that just shows the huge amount of thinking that's gone into every single element. Here's a different shoe, but it's the same man. And so there's a the sandal, there's a shoe that we're making at the moment. So again, the uh, sandal is open, so we've got to be very careful where we place these tabs so that it covers his toes and they don't stick out. Whereas with the shoe, nice little bit of decoration there to attract attention. And at first sight, it does look like a normal shoe. And you realize it's quite bulky. But if you actually look at what's happening, this part of the shoe is the lowest part of the shoe. So again, just like the sandal, we support the foot there. We have a rocker on the front there so that as his weight comes at heel lift, he rocks off. And we have just about uh, 2% two, uh, two of his weight under the joint where it's broken in order to keep it from breaking any further. So the elements that go into the prescription the insoles, the stiffeners, the toe puffs, you know, wall toe puff with nothing on the top, the way the enter is, the cushion collar, the uh, cushioning inside, which is really uh, substantial and very, very soft under here, very soft uh, memory foams in there. That huge complex of prescriptions has to be right all the way through. And if one element is wrong, then, it, then the whole shoe won't work. Uh, so this is a very, very complex uh, process uh, and can only really be done by bespoke orthopedic. The alternative is a person will be in, in a wheelchair. So uh, very, very difficult to get right. And often we have to take it apart and try different paddings and different styles uh, in order to get it to work. But once it does work, it's very satisfying because 
we're actually making a huge difference to somebody's future, transforming their future into being one in which they can walk with relative ease, relative comfort, and uh, rejoin society.